Hello and welcome back. You've made it to the home stretch. This is the first lecture in our last big chunk of information this semester. From this point forward, we'll be covering deuterostomes and we'll begin with our lecture on echinoderms. And this is chapter 22 in your textbook. As I just mentioned, echinoderms are deuterostomes. And these are the first deuterostomes that we're covering this semester. And just as a reminder, they're deuterostomes because their blastopore later becomes their anus rather than their mouth. Echinoderms undergo radial cleavage and they also undergo enterocelous coelom formation. And actually their coelom is composed of three parts and it's called a tripartite coelom. Echinoderms are, uh, exhibit radial symmetry, but this is a derived characteristic rather than an ancestral one. And we know this due to two pieces of evidence. One, we see ancient, ancient fossils of echinoderms that are bilaterally symmetrical. And so you can see an example of that in this picture down here. This is an artist's rendition of what a uh, very ancient echinoderm ancestor looked like based on fossil evidence. You can very clearly see that this ancestor is bilaterally symmetrical. And so this gives us um, some very clear evidence that bilateral symmetry was actually ancestral in this group. And if you look at some more recent um, uh, fossils from echinoderms, we start to see uh, the radial symmetry develop and they're actually uh, were sessile and radially symmetrical. So we can just track that they started bilaterally symmetrical and then became radially symmetrical. And then some of them have actually derived a secondary bilateral symmetry. So we'll see this in sea cucumbers and some species of sea urchins they're bilaterally symmetrical again, but this is not an ancestral characteristic. It is a derived one. And the radial symmetry in echinoderms is actually quite unique. They're the most advanced, most complex um, animals that exhibit this symmetry. Last time we talked about radial symmetry, we were looking at cnidarians, which are much simpler animals. And so it baffles a lot of scientists as to why echinoderms would um, evolve these, this radial symmetry when there's so many advantages to being bilaterally symmetrical, especially for carnivorous echinoderms. So this is something that they're trying to figure out out there. Oh, and despite the fact that some of them, uh, some echinoderms are bilaterally symmetrical, they do still have this pentaradial skeleton. And this is how we, we know that the uh, bilateral symmetry in like sea cucumbers and some sea urchins is not an ancestral characteristic that it's uh, a derived characteristic because otherwise they wouldn't still have that pentaradial skeleton that we see in the radially symmetrical echinoderms. And um, the reason why echinoderms get their name is because their body is covered in these spines or protuberances. And this picture up here is really good at showing you what they look like. So these are the spines along the body. They don't always have to be so uh, pronounced. Sometimes they're a little bit more flat, like kind of flat bumps, but the, these protuberances is where they get their name, echinoderm. Phylum echinodermata is a group of very unique organisms. And there are a few features that we only see in echinoderms. One of which is the presence of an endoskeleton that's made of either large or small calcified plates called ossicles. And you can see them in these two pictures here as some examples, this one and this one. The top picture are ossicles from a starfish and the bottom picture are ossicles from a sea urchin. Um, you can tell they're very different. Um, the top picture is a lot more porous. The starfish has a lot more uh, holes between its ossicles than we see in the sea urchin that's far more compact. But all echinoderms have these ossicles that make up their endoskeleton. They also all have water vascular systems and they have these protrusions called pedicellaria and pedicellaria are these small jaw like structures that are um, on the surface of the echinoderms that are responsible for clearing away debris that may settle on the skin. And you can see them in both of these pictures um, over here. They, these little jaw like pincer structures are the pedicellaria and then you can also see them down here. This is a close up of the skin. These are also pedicellaria um, here. And then in addition to this, they also have these dermal brachia, which are called papula. And this is what they use to undergo respiration. And those can also be seen in this picture above. These kind of clear, transparent uh, structures are the papula. 
And then finally, they all have pentaradial, pentaradial symmetry as adults. And so we just talked about even if they exhibit bilateral symmetry as a derived characteristic, they still have that pentaradial structure, um, it, but it might not be nearly as apparent. It may be um, only exhibited on the inside of the animal rather than as apparent as in a starfish, though you can see it on the outside. Echinoderms are marine. Um, you do not see them in brackish or fresh water, and this is because they do not have the ability to osmoregulate. So if they get into water that's too fresh, uh, like brackish water or fresh water, they will end up dying. The vast majority of echinoderms are benthic, meaning that they live on the uh, seafloor, but they can also be pelagic in a few species. And um, they can be benthic at deep, deep seas where all you see is blackness down there and in shallow waters like in coral reefs and in the intertidal zone. For the most part, they're either particle feeders or uh, predators. And as particle feeders, they can be suspension feeders or deposit feeders. And they are common commensals. They have a lot of commensalistic relationships with corals and coral reefs, um, with other organisms. In your book, they mentioned that there is an organism that will live in the anus of the uh, sea cucumbers. And they, it's a beneficial relationship for both organisms. So they can en engage in a lot of relationships um, in their uh, niches. And some examples are sea stars, brittle stars, sea cucumbers, sea urchins, and sea lilies. As we're talking about echinoderm anatomy and physiology, we'll be using class Asteroidea as our model. And this class includes starfish. And we're using these as our model, and your book uses this as the model, because there are various characteristics that are present within this class that are also present in various other echinoderm classes as well. So once we get to the section of the lecture where we talk about the other classes of echinoderms, I'll point out key differences between those classes and class Asteroidea um, as we go through each of those. And so we're going to start with the anatomy and physiology from outside in. The, cili the epidermis of starfish is ciliated, and they have these projections called pedicellaria, which we just uh, mentioned in the last picture. You can see some of those um, jaw-like structures, and this picture is really good. It's showing you an up-close view of what they look like. Um, they can be large or small, and the ones I pointed out in the last picture were much, much larger. They were clearly very visible. And these jaw-like structures oftentimes surround the spines of the epidermis, and they're responsible for clearing away any debris. And this helps to prevent uh, algae from settling and establishing on the skin, but also helps to uh, keep the um, pathogens away from the skin as well to keep the echinoderm um, healthy. And it also helps to keep the uh, skin clear for the respiratory structures so they don't get clogged. And um, you can see in this picture here, they show you the spine and the pedicellaria that kind of are at the base of the spine, clearing away any excess debris. These pedicellaria can also play a role in food acquisition in some species, especially those that are deposit or suspension feeders. The endoskeleton of uh, echinoderms is made of these calcareous plates called ossicles, and they're these kind of block-like structures in this picture above. And these ossicles are held together by something called catch collagen. And catch collagen is unique. It's not like the collagen we normally think of that's uh, pretty rigid and fibrous, but also has a little bit of flexibility. Instead, this collagen is under neural, neuronal control, and they can go from being a liquid to a solid back to a liquid. And so how the organism is able to use this is they're able to um, switch from liquid collagen to solid collagen to hold particular positions without having to use their muscles. So imagine if you see a starfish and it's trying to catch um, a sea anemone or something like that, right? And so it's, it's sneaking up and then it wants to raise off the ground and hold a particular position. It uses muscles to raise up off the substrate and hold that position. And then it will use um, neuronal control to uh, convert its catch collagen from liquid to solid. Once it's converted to solid, which is very, very quick, um, they can then relax their muscles and they'll still maintain that same static position. That's because their skeleton is now, their endoskeleton has now hardened 
And then once they're ready to uh, collapse themselves back onto their prey or go back to moving or whatever they want to do, they can then um, change that catch collagen from solid back to liquid and then everything will go back to normal under muscular control. So this can be a very useful and energy efficient technique for echinoderms to use when catching prey or baiting predators and various other things. They also have these projections through their epidermis or their dermal layer called papula or papulae and they're kind of hard to see here but they're these like kind of thin projections and they're basically just um, small projections of the coelomic cavity that extend past the obstacles and out of the body and they're responsible for aiding in respiration. Starfish have five arms and um, we'll look at some other echinoderms as well that you may not see five arms, but they also have a pentaradial structure. So even if they don't have five arms, there's still that core five projection type pattern. And you'll see that when we talk about sea urchins and everything else in the other classes. And so each of these arms has something called the, um, oh, sorry, before we get into that, sorry. Um, and then they also have an oral mouth and their oral mouth is always facing the substrate. And they have an ab aboral anus, which is almost invisible. And so it's very, 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 very tiny. Um, the picture is showing you that little black dot is their anus. And then also on their aboral side, they have something called the madreporite. And the madreporite is responsible for bringing in water into the water vascular system. And we'll cover that in the next slide. And they also have, each of their arms has something called the ambularical groove and, or ambularical groove, sorry. And that's these like lines you see going down the arms here. And that groove contains various different um, anatomical features, one of which is it, they have a radial nerve that runs through each of those grooves. And then on the sides of those grooves, um, you can also see the tube feet, which they're showing you in this picture up here, or as these kind of like yellow bundle cylinders are the tube feet that are adjacent to the ambularical groove and then the tube feet are protected by a layer of spines that run along the outside of the tube feet and then also the water vascular system runs through the ambularical groove as well the uh, groove can be either open or closed um, it's primarily open which means it's exposed to the environment in sea stars and sea lilies and it's mostly closed in um, all the other echinoderms and closed basically just means that that groove is covered or protected by either ossicles or some sort of dermal tissue. When looking at the ambularical grooves, we can see both radial nerves and the water vascular system. And the water vascular system is a unique feature of echinoderms and it plays a role in locomotion, excretion, respiration, and food acquisition. So how does it work? Well, we start at the madreporite. Water enters into the organism via the madreporite on the aboral side, and then water travels down the stone canal, which is a little hard to see in this picture, but it's a little tube here, into the ring canal. And the ring canal has these projections called the polyan vesicles, and they play a role in regulating the water pressure um, within the water vascular system. And so the water will fill the ring canals and then be diverted into the lateral canals that are within each of the um, ambularical grooves. And then from the lateral canals, the water will go into the ampulla. And the ampulla are shown as these little dots, these little balls here. And the ampulla are these kind of um, ball-like structures that hold water that are anterior to the tube feet or what uh, you can also call podia. And so you see them in this picture here. Oh, let's erase some of this. Okay, there we go. So you can see it really well in this picture here. This is the apula and then the podium or the tube feet is this lower portion here. And so water will fill the ampulla and then the muscles of the ampulla will contract. And when those muscles contract, it forces the water out of the ampulla into the podium. And this will cause the podium to extend. When the uh, tube foot needs to be contracted, then the muscles 
retract here labeled as retractor muscles in the podium will contract and that will force water from the podium back into the ampulla so that the tube foot can be retracted. You can also control the direction of the podium. So you can contract muscles on either side of the podium. So here you can see the muscles on the left side are being contracted and that will cause the, um, the tube foot to turn left or you can contract the muscles on the right side and that will cause the um, podium to turn right. You can also pull up this kind of basal plate here in the podium and not all animals can do this, not all echinoderms can do this, but some echinoderms can pull up that terminal plate and this will cause a suction to occur between the tube foot and the substrate. And so this is common in a lot of starfish. We'll use this ability to scale rocks or attach themselves securely to rocks in intertidal zones where there could be a lot of uh, turbulence due to water. Most echinoderms have a complete digestive tract, complete with a mouth, esophagus, stomach, intestines, and anus, though some lack intestines and anus and instead have a blind gut where food comes into the mouth and waste must leave through the mouth as well. And um, you can see various structures of the digestive tract here and here in both of these pictures. But what I really want to point out is this cardiac stomach. So some echinoderms have the ability to uh, extend their stomach, the lower portion of their stomach, out of their body in order to externally digest their food. And then they'll suck up the uh, digested food uh, nutrients into their body. So most digestion is external. And you can see a picture here, all this kind of like fleshy, kind of translucent material that's not the fish is this starfish's stomach. And they clearly have extended their stomach out of their mouth to digest these fish. And then given enough time, those fish will no longer be present, um, except for just some skeletons and all the other nutrients will have been absorbed by that starfish. Not all starfish are carnivores. Some are uh, deposit feeders or filter feeders. And in these cases, they can use their um, ciliated epidermis to sweep particulate matter towards their ambulacral grooves. And then from the ambula ambulacral grooves, they'll continue to sweep the food towards the mouth for ingestion. The nervous systems of echinoderms are not well developed. They have no brain and no ganglia. They simply just have a nerve net and all the other sensory organs are highly underdeveloped in echinoderms. So when it comes to their nervous system, they're relatively simple. The vast majority of echinoderms are dioecious, but some can reproduce asexually. And they can do this by splitting their central disc in two and then separating those two pieces. And then over time, those two pieces will regenerate their missing parts. So what this would look like is if we have a starfish and then we have our central disc, which is that whole middle section, and then your ambulacral grooves. If this organism were to divide its central disc in two down the middle and separate those two halves, given enough time, each of those halves would regenerate their missing parts and we would end up with two clones of the parent echinoderm, in this case, a starfish. And regeneration is not limited to reproduction. Many uh, echinoderms will sacrifice an arm in order to escape from predators or escape from being trapped. Um, this does not come without a cost, right? So it takes them several months to regenerate that missing limb, but it's better than being dead. So it's worth the sacrifice. And if that limb is not consumed by a predator, in some species, it can go on to regenerate a whole new organism. And um, even if that, that piece of that arm doesn't contain some of the central disc, in some species, it can still regenerate a whole new starfish. That'll be a clone of the, um, the parent where that arm originated from. Most echinoderms undergo external fertilization and they develop from a free swimming larva. And this larva is bilaterally symmetrical. And so you can see some examples in this picture here. In this column are several examples of bilaterally symmetrical echinoderm larva. And then uh, we're just gonna follow along in this column with this larva. And so these larvae are ciliated and they're free swimming. 
And then over time, um, as they're undergoing development, they will develop these three kind of uh, arm-like projections. And these uh, projections are adhesive. And this will allow them to attach to a substrate and they'll make a very small stock, which is what you can see in this picture down here. And once the larva attach to the substrate, they'll start to undergo metamorphosis. And so in the free swimming larva, they have bilateral symmetry and their anus and mouth reflect that orientation. So they have a posterior anus and an anterior mouth. Both this anus and mouth will disappear as the larva is um, further developing and they will generate new mouth and anus that are not anterior and posterior anymore. Instead, they'll be on the left and right side or what were the left and right side of the larva. And so what you can see in this picture here that they're showing you that the mouth, the new mouth is now on what would have been the left side of the larva. And then um, it's a little bit hard to see because they've switched the orientation of the picture and uh, of the larva in this picture down here, but the anus is now on the right side. And as the um, larva continues to develop into a juvenile and eventually into an adult, the left side of the larva will become later become the oral side and the right side will later become the aboral side. And so the larva is attached it's undergoing metamorphosis and um, it will go from a bilaterally symmetrical larva to a radially symmetrical juvenile. The juvenile re will remain attached to the substrate until it develops its first arms and podia. Once the arms and podia are, um, are developed, then the uh, juvenile will go from being sessile to being motile and then the juvenile will continue to be motile and continue developing into an adult um, echinoderm. Now let's spend some time talking about the various classes of echinoderms. As we're going through these various classes, I'm going to point out some key differences between each class and the characteristics that we've learned about in class Asteroidea. And so we'll begin with class Ophiuridia. And Ophiuridia is the largest group of echinoderms. And one really interesting distinguishing feature about them is their long slender arms, as you see here and here. I love this above picture, very Tim Burton-esque. Um, but you can see though those, long, those really long slender arms may almost make them look like aliens. And because they're so slender, they have to contain all of their organs in their central disc. There's just simply no room in their arms to put their organs, unlike what we saw in class Asteroidea. They lack pedicillaria, um, papula, cilia, anuses, or intestines, so they have an incomplete gut. They also have an oral rather than an aboral madreporite, and that's being pointed out in this picture here. This is their madreporite on the oral rather than the aboral side. And they have closed ambulacral grooves, and uh, so that can be seen here. So the ambulacral grooves in the um, starfish would have been visible, but here you can't see them. Instead, all you see are these ossicle plates. So the, those grooves are considered to be closed. They primarily use their tube feet for feeding, but they don't have ampulla. So instead, their um, tube feet are driven simple, simple, simply by muscle movement rather than uh, the use of water to uh, extend the tube feet. They just use their muscles instead. And they're primarily um, able to move from place to place through the bending of their arms. So instead of using their tube feet for locomotion, they use their tube feet for feeding and then just use muscles in their arms uh, to kind of extend and pull and push themselves forward and back. Their larvae do not attach to the substrate during development, so they don't have that initial um, kind of foot-like projection to attach. Instead, they remain um, in the in the water column and then as they undergo development and these organisms are tend to be scavengers particle feeders or predators depending on the species and they include brittle stars and basket stars so this picture here is a brittle star and then this picture down here is the basket star next we have class echinoidea and there's a couple of notable members of this group one of them being these guys, sea urchins, 
Sea urchins are really well known because they have these very apparent spines on them. And these spines are actually anchored into ball and socket joints. So they're not static, they're actually movable. So if you sit and watch um, these sea urchins long enough, you'll start to see them move their spines. And this is important because these spines play a major role in locomotion. And of course, there is an exception to this rule, and those would be the sand dollars. Clearly, you can see from the sand dollar, you don't see those uh, defined spines. Instead, uh, it's a lot more smooth. Their protrusions have been smoothed out um, for the most part. Another interesting characteristic of sand dollars is that they're secondarily bilaterally symmetrical. And so you can see that if you split this animal in half here, and um, this bilateral symmetry, just as a reminder, is a derived characteristic, not an ancestral one. In both cases, in sand dollars and in sea urchins, they have tightly packed ossicles. And you're familiar with this if you've ever seen an endoskeleton of a sand dollar on the beach. Um, it's just kind of one large plate rather than having a porous um, kind of uh, shell left behind or an endoskeleton left behind. And then this picture down here does a really good job at showing you how the ossicles of a sea urchin are very, very, very closely packed together. So each of these kind of scaling looking pieces in this image are the ossicles and they're basically so close together they might as well be fused at that point. All uh, members of this class lack arms and they, but they do still have five ambulacral grooves. They're just not nearly as, um, as uh, apparent. So you can see them in this picture down here of this sea urchin. Um, they're showing you four out of the five. You see one, two, three, four. And if this wasn't an open picture, the fifth one will be coming out at us. And they're not that apparent because they're closed. They're covered by ossicles. So if they were open, like in starfish, we could see them. But because they're covered by ossicles, we can't really see them. But these ambulacral grooves do have tube feet, but those tube feet have to extend past the endoskeleton out of the epidermis to get to the environment. And uh, this picture is trying to show you those. It's kind of hard to see them here, but they're uh, showing you here. They'll they extend through the um, past the ossicles, past the endoskeleton via small holes in the endoskeleton. Another interesting thing about the ampullarchal grooves in uh, sea urchins is that it extends from their oral to their aboral side. Because they're very rounded, they, um, the grooves start near the mouth and then they wind all the way up to the aboral side near the anus. The, um, the members of this class use tube feet and spines for locomotion, at least in the case of echinoderm, oh, not echinoderms, in the case of sea urchins, they can use those spines to help them uh, basically almost like roll along the, um, the ocean floor. And then many of them will have, especially sea urchins, will have venom injecting pedicellar, cellia? Sorry. Um, and so this is an effective way of them uh, protecting themselves from predators, um, even in addition to the fact that they're covered in spines, right? Many things are not going to want to eat them, uh, with the exception of like sea otters and a couple other marine uh, organisms. For the most part, organisms tend to stay away from these guys. And um, members of this class are also omnivores, and it includes obviously sea urchins and sand dollars. Members of class Holotheridia are soft bodied. And this is because even though they do have ossicles, their ossicles are highly reduced and dispersed throughout the body. So there's a lot less hard surfaces and a lot more squishy tissue. They're also secondarily bilateral. So this is a derived characteristic in this group. And this includes sea cucumbers. They have circular and longitudinal muscles and a hydrostatic skeleton. So based on what we just covered with annelids, this should give you some idea of one method of locomotion in these animals. They also have tube feet on um, all of their ambulacral grooves, which they have five of, like um, the vast majority of echinoderms. But the two dorsal ambulacral grooves, there's, those tube feet are actually modified. They're not uh, used for locomotion anymore. Instead, they're usually modified for sensing their environment or doing other things. Um, their ventral tube feet on those three ambulacrals that um, are facing the substrate are used for locomotion.
but not all species have tube feet. Um, some of these species that are more burrowers have lost their tube feet altogether, but they will still have those ambulacral grooves. Many have these oral tentacles that they use for food, and these are actually modified tube feet. And um, they can be seen in both of these pictures here. So they're showing you these tentacles on their oral side here. And they also, you can see a real life example here. And they, of course, they can use those in combination with mucus to catch any particulate matter or um, per, uh, particulates that are on the substrate and bring them into the mouth. They also have these key structures that are unique to this class called the respiratory trees. And those are these structures. Let me see a dark color. These structures here. And this is the only class that has these. And they use these for respiration and excretion. So of course, respiration makes sense. And for excretion, they can um, bring in water into these respiratory trees and push that water out of the anus, which helps to push the waste out of the organism. And to protect themselves, um, sea cucumbers will do something very interesting. They will expel part of their internal organs to escape from harm. Um, so that's what you're looking at in this picture here. All this kind of white gooey stuff. Let me see a different color. This white tentacly gooey looking stuff here are their actual internal organs. So they've projected some of their um, organs out of their anus or they might even rupture their um, epidermis to uh, remove the organs from their body. And this will give them a, a way to escape from predators, right? One, either the predator will attack that uh, piece of organ giving the animal time to escape and then that organ actually becomes sticky and it will attach itself to the predator's uh, face and this will also give the organism time to, to get away because now the animals the predator is struggling to get the that piece of organ off of their face and then they just regenerate those organs later on once they make it to safety and as i mentioned an example are the sea cucumbers Members of class Crinoidea tend to be sessile. Some of them can become modal or are modal at some point in their lives. However, they do spend a significant portion of their lives in one place. All uh, members of this class are derived from a free swimming larva though. Um, that free swimming larva eventually attaches to the substrate. And then in the case of sea lilies, they will attach to a substrate and remain attached via this stalk projection here on their arboreal side. And um, that stalk is attached to the aboral side, which allows the oral side to be facing the environment so they can catch food. Members of this class, such as feather stars, which is this guy down here, are motile, but they do tend to spend significant portions of time hanging around in one spot. So they're not sessile, but they can almost be kind of sort of considered to be sessile, even though they are motile. All members of this class have branching arms, which are pretty well apparent in both of these pictures. They have this kind of feather-like appearance. They lack madreporite spines or pedicel area, um, but they do have those ambulacral grooves like we talked about in all the classes thus far. And those ambulacral grooves are open, so they're not covered by epidermal tissue or by ossicles. Um, they're more like what we see in class Asteroidea, where they're open to the environment. And they do have tube feet, but they use their tube feet for feeding rather than for locomotion. An example being obviously sea lilies, which is this top picture, or feather stars, which is the bottom picture. Finally, we have class Asteroidea, which is what we've spent the vast majority of our time um, in this presentation talking about in detail. So if you want more information about key details in this class, see the first half of this presentation. And one major group of organisms that are, belong to this class are your sea stars. So that's the end of our lecture on echinoderms. It was relatively short. Um, go ahead and read chapter 22, read the introduction, and then 22.4, and then uh, do the chapter 22 connect assignment. And if you
want, feel free to watch any of these videos. Um, some of them will provide more information on the topics we've covered here. And some of them are just showing you some cool features of echinoderms. They're some of my favorite um, organisms out there. So hopefully you enjoyed this lecture. Um, next lecture, we'll cover hemichordates and chordates. Uh, and then for the rest of the semester, we'll be talking about chordates.